close our eyes for a moment. If there's something in your hands, put it on the floor. Thanks. Take a deep breath in. Feel your belly. Feel your chest. Right up to the backs of your shoulders. <sighs> Do the same again. Feel your belly. Feel your chest. Right up to the backs of your shoulders one more time. And once again, feel your belly, feel your chest, feel your body with air, and then hold that breath inside of you. Hold it as long as you can. And whenever you're ready, breathe out with a sigh as long and as loud as you dare. Ah. Without yet opening your eyes, I have an invitation for you. And the invitation is this. What if the reason that you're here in this room today is not the reason you think you're here? What if you don't yet know the reason you're here in this room? If you take me up on that invitation, then all sorts of possibilities become available to you that weren't just a moment before. So my invitation is to let go of the reason that you came to this room and to be open to any other possibility. And we'll find out what that is as time goes on. Turn up the corners of your mouth and allow your eyes to open. People see what you do. They rarely know how you feel. When people hear my bio, they hear stories about the Olympic athletes that I've coached. A client right now who's a Navy SEAL. One of my clients who, from a single question I asked her a year ago, is now, has just had her business valued at a billion dollars. A client of mine who became a coach 18 months ago had never coached before professionally, had a background as a fundraiser, became a coach. She's five foot two from Ohio. Her clients are now NFL players. I can tell you stories that have you say, wow, and that's fun for a moment. But it's easy to do that. And what I want to do is step behind that for a moment. You see, people see what you do, and they rarely know how you feel. I was bullied in my first job at 21 years old by someone who was a couple of years older than me. I got fired from a job that I loved and I was devastated. Over the years in my career, I've struggled to pay bills and worried where the next dollar is gonna come from. I never got the rule book about marriage, so I struggle sometimes in relationship to know how to show up. You know what? Will you help me out as I share some of my story? If any of these are true for you, will you raise your hand? Anyone else struggle with marriage sometimes? Anyone else like me didn't get the, the rule book? I struggle sometimes as a parent. Sometimes I lose my temper, get annoyed, get frustrated with my kids when really it's about me. I've wanted to write my second book for over two years and have been filled with fear and doubt and insecurity that's held me back from doing that. Anyone else have a project that they so want to create and hasn't yet made it happen? I'm sometimes lazy and insecure and feel that I'm not enough. And sometimes, on some days, I'm all three at the same time. <laughs> Thanks for helping me see I'm not alone. I'm an introvert, which doesn't mean I'm shy. I'm okay on stage in the front of the room, and I'm okay at the back in the restroom. I'm just not okay in the middle of the room making polite conversation. Anyone else? You know you're an introvert when plans for a night out get canceled and you're secretly relieved. <laughs> I'm 
And partly because of that, I can be really lonely even in the middle of a crowd. I can zone out on Facebook, Netflix, and junk movies because secretly I'm afraid of what I really want to do out in the world. When I accomplish something, however exciting it is, however proud I am of what I've accomplished, I give myself about 27 seconds to acknowledge myself, to be proud of what I've done before I'm looking at how I should have done it better, how I could have improved it, what I should do next, or what I did wrong. I go on the roller coaster of emotions in business. When my dad passed away four years ago, I had no energy to do anything to bring new business in. And for nine months, we used up almost every penny of our savings. Anyone know that side of the story? I can get incredibly jealous of other people's success. I don't need help, is the thought in my mind. So I won't ask you for help, and if you offer help, I won't accept it. I've been scared for a lot of my life, and interestingly enough, the more successful I become, the more scared I get, because there's more to lose. Anyone know that one? Here's three parts of my story that go right back to my childhood and inform who I am today. I tried to prove myself to my dad throughout my entire childhood and for a lot of my adulthood too. It was really only when he passed away that I began to do some deep reflection to realize that he'd always been proud of me. It was the most common thing people said to me after he passed away. You know how proud your dad was of you, right? And I knew it intellectually, but I didn't get it. And so this little boy who spent his whole life trying to prove himself to his father got really good at achieving, got really good at having success out in the world, because if only I could have this next success or this next achievement, well then, finally then, my dad will be proud of me. But you can never have enough of what you don't really need. You can never have enough of what you don't really need. And it turns out that that little boy who was so good at doing what he needed to do to have his dad be proud of him, who got really good at the world of achievement and success and looking good and trying to be liked, which never really worked, that little boy became really good at helping others to have all sorts of levels of success. I knew at a young age that I was different. I just didn't know it was okay to be different. Anyone have that feeling? Nice. I felt powerless as a child. I felt powerless. I was in a school play as a boy in a boy's school at 11 years old, and they cast me in a a female role. We only had boys in the school. It was a William Shakespeare play that makes me shudder to this day when I hear the title. It was A Midsummer Night's Dream. Because I didn't just have a female role, I had to play Titania. She's the queen of the fairies. When you're an 11 year old boy growing up in London in an all boys school, I was mortified. I went home and cried to my parents. I did not want to do this. What blows my mind to this day is that I didn't know I could say no. I I took the part. I didn't know I could say no. I felt powerless for so much of my childhood, and that's the thing. That little boy who felt powerless, my gift is I see your power. No matter who you are, no matter how powerful you appear out in the world, I see where there's that little tweak that you're lacking in the power. You haven't owned your power.
What I want to do today, I love that the, the two, twofold message for the next two days is create tr transformation and increase impact. Because I want to bring that into one presentation today. Because it's awesome when I hear about people want to impact a billion lives. But here's how I'm doing it. I'm doing it one person and one conversation at a time. And that's what I want to show you, the power of a single, single conversation that can transform the world. I used to be a high school teacher. For 15 years, I was a high school teacher, eventually a vice principal. I helped set up an international school in Southeast Asia. I, I worked in rural Africa and inner city London. So teaching is a passion of mine. And 13 years now, I've been a professional coach. Two more invitations for you. Number one, listen for insight, not agreement. I'm not here for you to like me. I'm not here for you to agree with me. Most of the time in the world, we're listening for agreement. Oh, I like what he said. I'll write that down. I don't like that piece. I'll ignore that. This one fits with my view of reality. That one doesn't. I won't serve you in the next two days if you listen for agreement. Listen for insight. What if I try on this new way of thinking just for this hour, just for this day? It doesn't work for me normally, but let me try it out. L my invitation to you is to listen for insight and not for agreement. And listen for transformation, not information. I'm not going to give you much information today. I'm going to create a presentation that is transformational. So you don't need to have lots of notes. I'll share with you later a document I've created about how to do deep coaching. It's got a self-assessment. You can assess yourself and see ways to improve. But I want to bring it in action today. You see, there are less than six inches between you and everything you want you right now. And it's these six inches here. Yeah, you got it. It's your thinking. I get paid a lot of money to mess with people's thinking. And I want to mess with some people's thinking today. So I'm going to bring two people up who I've met in the last couple of days. I don't know them very well. I've met them. We've had a brief conversation. I want to show you the power of coaching. But here's the thing. The sound of insight isn't, wow. I mean, it's cool if you're a coach and a client goes, wow. The real sound of insight is, huh. Because, huh, is a moment your world shifted. Could that really be, is that possible? And so, as you watch this coaching in action today, my invitation to you is to allow yourself the transformation in here. If you're a coach, you can watch me and say, well, I like that, I'll do this, I don't like that. You're welcome to put yourself in the coach's seat. But I invite you to put yourselves in the client seat too as we play. So I want to bring two people on stage, Mabel and Cassandra. Give them a, right, a round of applause, please. I got my two little boys in the audience here today. Hey, guys. Come and have a seat. Thank you. Hi. So I'm going to invite you guys to ignore them. Let's assume it's just the three of us in the room for a moment. Oh, let's get a microphone for you guys. You bring it first, Cassandra. Thanks. Hi. Hi. Thank you for, for saying yes to being here with me. Absolutely. My pleasure. Let's play. And I'm pausing for a moment because sometimes, as a coach, the real power is in the listening. And that's listening to my own body. And I'm realizing, oh, I'm not fully present yet, so I can't begin. And I want to because there's 400 people watching me. But listening is the most powerful piece of deep coaching. Where's my clicker? Deep listening. Hi. And now I feel a little bit more present because I'm speaking what's, <laughs> what's real. Okay. Cassandra, let's say we get together in three years' time, mm -hmm. 
and you say these words, holy shit, Rich. And you say, holy shit, it's 2021, and my life has transformed, both personally and professionally. What would you be talking about? What would you be telling me? I would definitely be talking about personal-wise, yeah. uh, that, you know, I've got a baby on the way, and, um, you so know, So let's do just... it this way. Let, let's have you travel through time. Instead of telling me what you would be telling me, you know what? It's Mind Valley You. And, and we came back together again, and I brought you back on stage to see what's happened. So first of all, congratulations on the baby. Thank you. Muzzle top. We're super excited. Right. <laughs> Um, elsewise, the business has been doing fantastic. We're about to open a new location um, outside of the States, and we've started working on our foster program. Tell me more about that. What's, what's the business doing these days? Well, uh, we're being able to reach so many more entrepreneurs and uh, changing the lives of small business owners just by taking all of the crud that they find themselves doing in their you know, day-to-day -day business lives and getting them back into what they want to be doing by taking all of the operational stuff out. So, you know, we're opening another location. It's just, it's not just my San Francisco Bay Area location. It's also another location somewhere else in the world that we can start working in other languages and everything. Tell me, because I feel your energy rising. Like, what's, what's exciting about that? Yeah, this smile. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I've got this um, special little uh, thing that some, of, that some people like to call um, anal retentive. Uh, and I really enjoy finding the little things that are going to change people's lives mm. and really just getting into the meat of something and then just poof, showing the one thing that can be sewn together or sewn into their own systems and their lives to make things easier. So that thing that for most people we would call anal retentive is actually the thing that juices you. Exactly. Yeah, it's um, just pattern recognition and then finding the patterns that are going to be the most impactful and then implementing them and being able to see uh, a client's eyes light up, just going like, oh my God, I finally have some space to myself. Huh. Um, I love that response. Yeah. Seeing a client's, client's eyes light up, that, that brings so much energy into my body when I see that. So mm -hmm. I totally get that. So take me back three years. Do you remember that time we sat on a stage in front of that group of people? What, what was holding you back back then? Mostly burnout. Huh. Um, burnout from my corporate job and um, from the four and a half years of, you know, less sleep and um, nonstop work. Uh, and then what, what just, that, just to, and take me back a bit in time. I'm mm -hmm. imagining that was some of your story even before then, you, that you knew that as a story, because what I hear out in the future is that's what you help other people avoid is that burnout. Absolutely. Did you know it for real in your own life? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, for a couple of months now, I started my own firm um, at the beginning of that year, right? Uh, and huh. to help other people avoid the issues that I was facing. So, you know, getting, getting my life back on track and getting my self-worth back because I tied it so hard into, you know, running this other firm. Um, and you, I just you spent what was my the other entire firm? life. It was a tax firm. And you ran it for somebody else? Yes. Yeah, I was the director uh, and spent four years of my life trying to keep him off drugs uh, and increase his company, which I did, you know, threefold by the time I left. But making it so that I myself lost my personal life and I lost my spiritual life and I lost absolutely everything else um, just because I subsumed myself with work. Because yeah. it's something I love and something I'm good at. But at the same time, Boundaries are a thing. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going I'm to talk some of the time to the audience and ask them, who knows that feeling of having a job that you love so much that it's actually hard to switch off from it because it feels so good to be working? Who, who knows that one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I imagine a lot of people in this room. So we're, we're not alone. I know that one too. Mm -hmm. I'm listening to the conversation, 
But I'm also listening for the perspective that my client's coming from. I want to see how she sees her world. So I'm getting a sense of what it was like in the past, how you were burnt out, the vision you have in the future, where you want to go. I'll put this up because you can see here. So I've got a sense of the dream. What's the fear? We always have this, the dream and the fear. What's standing in your way, slowing you down, or holding you back mm -hmm. from everything that you want right now? Honestly, it's like several different kinds of fear. Um, I'm scared to work hard again. I'm scared to put myself back into that mind frame where I subsume myself in work again um, in order to, you know, make my money. And, you know, I was making good money previously and I spent all of it getting my business set up and going to Mind Valley U and, uh, and I was so burned out that I couldn't work. Um, so and you're afraid so, you might replicate that old behavior, that old pattern. Exactly. So I've got some kind of, you know, money fear going on along with too much uh, work. I'm, I'm scared of burning myself out again. Hmm. So there's definitely that kind of, um, in Mind Valley terminology, abundance block going on there. Well, actually, it sounds to me that you have what I call a perfect system, that you're a master. If we said, we want you to teach a class to everybody here about how to accomplish amazing goals, build a business threefold, three times the revenue and, it, and impact, and burn yourself out in the process. You would know exactly how to teach that, right? Oh, I absolutely could. I, I would be very, very good at that class. So teach me for a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. I, I actually want you to take Cassandra's system for creating three times the revenue in any business you go to and burning yourself out in the process. Uh, well, first, it starts off with um, something from Eric Edmead's class that I listened to earlier. Uh, do it all yourself. Great. <laughs> that doesn't work so well, does it? Great. So, so don't worry about them. <laughs> Stay with me. Mm -hmm. Teach me. So, so, Rich, do it all yourself. Rich, do it all yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, focus more on getting what you're getting done instead of fighting with yourself to force, you know, whatever owner you happen to be working with into doing what's right for the business. Um, definitely that one. Got it. Um, because since, since we've been hired to do this, clearly that also means that we need to fight with the owner to make sure that we're doing our jobs. Okay. okay so add that level of tension in addition to doing all of the coding yourself, to doing all of the system set up yourself, all of the process formalization and setup, so all of the hiring. All the tension and then make up a rule that I have to do all these different things and take that all on as my own responsibility. Exactly. What's the secret one that, that no one would know? Like the, the really secret one about the masterful way to create three times the revenue and burn yourself out in the process. So what I'm doing is messing with her thinking. She wants to have this be something bad, but actually it's something amazing, it's a gift in here. And as we're drawing this out, I'm helping, I, I once worked with a woman who said, I constantly date emotionally unavailable men. I said, that sounds amazing, teach me how to do that. <laughs> And she had it down. She had a 17-point system. She could run seminars on it. But it brought a sense of humor to the struggle that she had. And from there, we were able to look at, well, what if that looked different? So what I'm doing here is leadership. I'm leading the client at times. I'm here to serve her, not to please her. I'm here to draw out a sense of what's the truth or tell the truth if it's needed. So let me come back to you. Did you get one? Is there a secret one that no one would know? Be lonely. Uh, how do I do that? I'm she, an she introvert. Knows, right? Like I'm messing with her thinking right now. <laughs> I, she said be lonely. How do, how do you do that? And her, you, your brain began to spin. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm an introvert. So thankfully that's very natural for me. And I hear you are too. So it shouldn't be difficult. Yeah, just be yourself. <laughs> nice. Thank you. So 
So let's pause there. Let me come to Mabel. Hi, Mabel. Hello. Hey. How can I serve you today? You see, sometimes you don't need a powerful question. Sometimes you just be present with the person you're with. How can I serve you today? Um, you can serve me by helping me stepping into my greatness. Huh. That's cool. Stepping into your greatness. I love this. When you hear me talk about working with high performers, it's a phrase I use a lot. But I, what, I, what I'm looking for is what I call the glimpse of genius. The glimpse of genius. Every one of you is a high performer. We all are. If we're in the right place doing the thing that we love and feels inspiring to us. So there's a story you have that there's greatness over here and you haven't yet stepped into it. Tell me more about that. Yeah. I've been working on this for a while, <laughs> and I'm making some progress, um, but um, I still find myself in these situations that sometimes I'm in my greatness and it feels so good, and I'm out there and then I'm helping, you know, I'm serving others like in the best way, uh, but then I still have a lot of these moments that I'm still so doubting myself, um, and it's, it has a lot to do with this fear of being rejected when I'm really out there, like really on fire, really great, that, you know, people would disconnect from me rather, yeah. you know, get connected to me. Yeah, I get that one. I get it in here. I'm, I'm curious, who else has that feeling that, okay, raise your hand, just keep your hands up for a moment. I want Mabel to get this. If you have that feeling, like if I'm, yeah. So we're not alone, me too. You heard me share some of my story at the beginning. In coaching, there's the personal and there's the universal. The personal is when I go into to my story to, to show you where I connect or into your story. And there's the universal. So here we go into the universal for a moment. At the universal level, you know what? Every single one of your ancestors, going back every single generation throughout human history, who didn't have that fear of standing up and stepping into their greatness, didn't survive. It's, it's coded into our, it's in our genetic code not to stand out, not to look good. Because if you did, in your tribe, if you stood out and they didn't like what you said, you'd be cast out of the tribe. You might have to battle someone who could kill you. So for most humans on the planet, we have a history of fearful ancestors. So good job, you're continuing that genetic line. <laughs> and we have a choice. Because for us, at least, there are still many people on the planet who don't yet have this choice, but we do, at least most of us in this room, of saying, do I want to end that genetic tie to my ancestors? Because for most of us, we won't die if we're disliked. We won't die if we stand strong. We won't die if we have a message. I've worked with a lot of powerful women over the years. There's, there's a concept called the mama bear effect. The mama bear effect is when a woman has a cause that's important enough, her mama bear will come out. There are women who've lifted cars off the legs of their children because there's been an accident. This super, superhuman strength comes in. What's the cause that you have that this whole story that you've got about, like, should I step into my greatness? Should I not? Should I speak up? What if they dislike me? What have I been re rejected? What's the cause, excuse my French, that's so fucking powerful that nothing will stop you, Mabel? I'm not sure I understand your question. What's the mission you're on that is so powerful that if you own that mission, you won't care. Like, I don't care what people think about me because the mission is more important than whether you like me or not. Oh, I feel it already. Okay. <laughs> yeah, me. well, it's, it's, it's helping, you know, it's leading and showing the way to humanity plus that's it. And put that in, in different ways so I can get it. What does that mean? Um, well, at the moment, I'm, I'm serving in that way with uh, my company, The New Business Women, uh, and really helping women, like teaching what I need myself most, uh, to uh, step into their greatness and, um, you know, stepping out of the rat race of society and, you know, build a, a true life that you're, or a, a life that you're truly happy with. Isn't it funny yeah. how we teach what we most need to learn? Yeah, that, I teach others that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who, who else knows that feeling? Like, my gift is part of my greatest struggle. And there's a reason for that. 
it, it, it's great. It's why I wanted to start with my struggles, because then you, you get, like, you know that world, so you see a path beyond it. So there's a mission that's powerful. You've got to lead the way, and that's not going to be easy. And people follow when we're willing to step up and do the thing that we're helping them to do. Mm -hmm. What's happening in this moment? I'm thinking about uh, um, a phrase that a while ago somebody said to me, said like, what if you're supposed to annoy them? Huh. <laughs> I, I've, been writing an <laughs> I've been writing an article for a while, I've never yet published it, but it's called Why Your Clients Need to Say I Hate You More Often. <laughs> yeah. Your job is to polarize people. Yeah. And the ones who don't like you will, will move out of the way. The ones who, who love it will, will stay with you and then you get to really help them fly. Yeah. Let me come back to Cassandra. Hey, where are you in this moment in this conversation? Because there's, there's two conversations going on, so what's going on? Um, I, I'm just uh, absorbing it and um, to some extent, you know, putting the overlay, walking through the mental hedge to just sit on the other side of that um, and kind of view that uh, as an overlay in my life as well. What do you mean by that overlay? Say more. Um, well, trying on a new way of thinking. And what is the new way of thinking? Oh, well, exactly that. <laughs> Say what no, is it? your words, yeah. Well, what is it um, that is going to make me unstoppable? Uh, okay. What is it that I'm going to get so pissed off about that I just blow through everything in my path, including my own, um, my own issues. Nice, I love anger and frustration in the client. I can work with anger and frustration because there's something, they're, they're, they're a mask for desire. So I'm willing at times, let's go back. Can we get the slides on guys? Thanks. Um, leadership is that willingness to frustrate your client, to annoy your client, to bring anger up and work with it because then there's something magical on the other side of that. So what pisses you off? <sighs> well, uh, there are several things that piss me off, um, but one of them is the way that we treat, one of them is the way that we treat our, um, you know, uh, our foster kids. And um, in, in the United States, it's, you know, foster kids are orphans and, Orphans are foster kids, like the way that we so deal let, with it. Let, is me, the let same. me do this. Let me take you out of the story because I'm th I have a sense it's a story you've told many times. Mm. Tell me a story about foster children that makes you cry. <laughs> well, here's my favorite one. Um, when you're a foster kid, they give you a trash bag for all of your belongings. What the hell does that tell you about yourself if you're in that position? And again, I'm, I'm intellectually engaged, I'm, I'm moved by the, the thought of that, but make it real. Tell me about a family you know that, where there was a foster child, or the, the thing that makes it real. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I have an adult foster child um, that lives with me now. Um, and Boy or she, girl? Girl. girl. What's yeah. her name? Uh, her name is Debbie. How old's Debbie? Uh, Debbie is 22 now. How long did she live with you for? She's been living with me for one year. Huh. I got her out of an abusive um, relationship, um, and she's learning how to be herself and gaining some self-esteem and all of that because, you know, she'd been passed around from one, you know, group home to another that nobody ever treats them like, uh, they call it group home. Nobody ever treats it like it's a home. And the only, uh, let me, she still hoards food sometimes. Like it's. Um, what, how does that impact you when you see her hoarding food? It reminds me of myself when I was a kid. Because I had the same. Uh, so I never went into the foster system right. um, because we had family that would help us out when things were really, really rough. And my parents were absolutely awesome. But at the same time, there were things that were just too much. So sometimes our family would take us in um, or friends uh, and just be able to kind of step in and take the pressure off of them so that, you know, other things wouldn't happen. So I never went into the foster system and I am absurdly grateful for that. 
um, because I've known many foster kids over the years. So let me pause you for a moment. I want to talk to everyone else. If it was just me and Cassandra, I'd go into the story till I found the moment that made her cry because there's something in here that moves her soul and stirs her to tears. And you're on a stage in front of an audience, and so you've, it, it, I, I'm not going to put, I'm not trying to make her cry, <laughs> but in the right space, I'd go deeper till we got to that place. But I feel your passion, and I feel your heart. I can't imagine what it was like to be in that situation as a child, and I can see your passion and desire for this here <laughs> out into the future. What's the biggest insight you've had so far in this conversation? I haven't really felt anything seriously profound, but uh, going into another thought overlay and putting that on to, you know, uh, brainstorm what it would take to piss me off enough that I got past my own fear for long enough to actually, uh, you know, to actually make that kind of change. Because uh, I get fired up, but, you know, my rage is a little bit quick burning and then it goes out. Uh -huh. um, so it's, uh, so basically the conversation is making me think, what would it take to get that, you know, mama bear rage as you were talking about. So the sound of insight isn't always wow, but a question is powerful. So most coaches will show up and they'll try and answer the questions of their clients. I think the job of, of, a, of deep coaching is to help your clients live into more powerful questions. What's the thing that would have my rage burn so furiously that I'd be willing to do and say things that I've not yet been willing to do or say? That I'd be bold enough to make that impact that I wanna have? That I'd shift the world of dozens or hundreds or thousands of kids in the foster system? That would be an interesting place to come from. Absolutely. Hmm. I have an idea, but... Go ahead. Uh, it's what would keep it for long enough because I do want to change this system. Um, and every little once in a while, I get so fired up that I start um, making those changes and you know, knocking down the walls and moving forward a little bit. But I don't know how to sustain the, I don't know how to sustain the emotion to keep me going. It's probably not emotion that you need. So let me ask, who in the audience has a cause that you are passionate about, about making a difference or an impact in the world, and you've been in that game for five years, 10 years, maybe even longer? Can we just get a show of hands? So there are plenty of people here who found a way to tap into something that has them keep going in the face. And how many of you faced, same people whose hands were up a moment ago, have faced challenges and ups and downs and struggles in that journey? Right. Do you see the hands? That's, that's important, you get that. Just keep the hands up, guys. So I have a ground rule when there's lots of coaches in the room. I call it no coaching without permission. My request is, don't coach anyone who's been on this stage without their permission. But if you've been on a journey like this and you're an invitation to Cassandra to sit down with you, then her mind just shifted into a new way of thinking that you might have insights for her if you're open to that. I am absolutely open to that because it's something just like most of our causes that needs to change and it needs to change 20 years ago and so now. So I, I'm hearing that even more than helping individuals in the foster care system, actually changing the system is something that really lands in here. Oh, yes. Um, oh, yes. So greatness versus possibility. Probability, sorry, I'm pointing out here. Greatness versus probability. This is the key distinction in 10 xing somebody, in taking them bigger than they've come into you with in their goals. Thanks, Cassandra. Mabel, where are you in this moment? Just really listening. <laughs> and and what if, what's, what's the, the biggest insight you've had in this moment? Any time throughout this conversation, one of the simplest things as a coach is to check in with them, to ask them. Your job isn't to give them insights, it's to create the space 
for an insight. Let me ask you, who's had an insight at any point during this conversation for their life or their world or even their coaching? Beautiful. Thank you. Hey. Well, I think um, what comes to mind is that every time that I, when I feel that I'm like stepping away from my greatness, because it feels like that, it's not, yeah, it's like shrimping a little bit, right? Shrinking. You shrink. Yeah, I shrink, yeah. Um, that I can tune into, let's call it my calling, or, hmm. you know, the thing that is um, pulling me forward. And what is that? Yeah. Tell me about, what's the thing that pulls you forward? Um, I guess it's the, you know, the vision for the future that I have. So here's where we go from the universal into the personal. Tell me about one person who either you've seen transform and you're so proud of that journey she's been on, or someone you so have that desire, like if only she'll get this, oh my God, that would feel so amazing. I actually have to think of my business partner, Richard, yeah. 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 Can yeah. you say the name? Crystal, yeah. Tell me about Crystal. Um, well, she's, she's such an extraordinary woman, uh, very uh, big heart, so very ambitious. You, you, the smile, if you, sorry, let's put the cameras back on us, guys. Um, the smile that came on Mabel's face the moment she thought of Crystal, if you were close enough to see it. <laughs> so tell me more. <laughs> I'm in love with this woman. <laughs> huh. Yeah, but no, but seriously, uh, the big heart, like the big ambition she has, like her um, willingness to, to do everything, to touch so many people, uh, her willingness to, you know, overcome her fears and just go out there. Yeah. Sounds like she inspires you. Yes. Nice. Yeah. What do you think would be possible if other people were able to emulate Crystal? To be, what? To emulate Crystal, be more like Crystal. If some of these women in your community, if all the women in your community could be more like Crystal, how would that be? Well, the world would uh, be a better place, <laughs> for sure. Huh. Yeah, because they will also um, start living their life from, from love and from compassion and, uh, and, and starting that towards themselves and, you know, and go act from there. Hmm. And then, uh, yeah, really make an Im impact. So when it comes to coaching, I love to play this game of helping clients to dream bigger than they've ever dreamed. But there are two women here who have big dreams inside of them. We've just been pulling them out a little bit. Lots of coaches go straight into strategy. Michael Neal has a lovely story. A client goes to see a coach and they're a carpenter. And the carpenter says to the coach, can you help me grow my business? Coach says, yeah, sure. I know what you need. You need a PR strategy. You need a marketing person. We need to work on your SEO. You need a website. We need to have you presenting on stages and go through this entire strategic system to help this carpenter. And when they're complete, the carpenter says, thank you so much, that was amazing. And as he's walking out the room, the coach looks back at the carpenter and says, oh, I forgot to ask you one question. What's your name? And the carpenter looks back and says, oh, my name? My name's Jesus. Where's the greatness in front of you? You need to draw out that greatness, what I call eliciting and 10x on these elements before you get anywhere near strategy. And, and often, I don't go to strategy at all with my clients by helping them live into a better question, they know everything they need to do to make this happen. So Mabel, what's the one question that if you took away from here and you asked yourself this question every day for a year, just one question, what would be the question that would really shift things for you? Um, difficult one, Rich. <laughs> it's supposed to be. If it was easy, we wouldn't be playing together, right? 
There's one that comes to mind for me is something like this. How can I help the women in my community to be more like Crystal? What happens when you hear that? It makes it really like concrete and mm. tangible, right? Mm. Yeah. Very, um, yeah, I immediately see a lot of faces, like women in our academy and yeah, that would definitely work for them. <laughs> so this is the sound of insight, right? I'm not trying to get the right question in this moment. I'm sharing this possibility that there is a question which if you asked and answered for yourself every single day for a year, things would shift. I'm gonna tell you guys a secret and, and that Mabel won't hear, which is everything she sees in Crystal, everything she admires about Crystal, she only sees it, right, because it's in her. And at some point, she'll get that. I don't wanna tell her now, because it might be a bit too soon. <laughs> but at some point, that will click. And she'll step even further into this. Thank you, Mabel. Can you give the mic to Cassandra? Thanks. Cassandra, how about for you? What, what's, if there was a question for you that you leave here with, what might the question be? You know, I've been trying to think of what that would be. <laughs> um, and I have to say that it would be what story can I tell myself today that's going to push me further towards my goals? I've got two things for you that come to me. One is, if you made it your mission to connect with as many people here who are, have a powerful mission, that there'll be insights and possibilities available to you that you couldn't even see from this moment right now. I think a, a, as a strategy or a tactic, that could be something really valuable for you in your time left at Mind Valley. It already has been. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think the question that comes to me for you, and it's not the right question, but it, it is, it's something around that fire inside of you. What is it that fires me up? What is it that, that I saw as a child that I don't want anyone else to ever have to go through? What is it that I see in the children I foster now that I don't want any other children to foster? Just getting to the heart of that, it's gonna really be powerful, it's gonna stir things up in you. And that I know the answer to. Yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> showing them the environment and showing them the safe space to discover their own passions and to discover their own power, because you know we're innately we're innately powerful, um, and foster kids in particular have never had that kind of experience. They've never experienced what it feels like to be powerful unless you know they're bullying some other kid. Um, it always comes down to themselves and enabling them to find their own place. Were you like me as a child? You felt powerless a lot as a child? Um, there were a lot of different ways that I felt powerless, um, and I would, you know, discover other ways to make myself feel powerful. Yeah. Yeah. I, there's more we could dig into this, and I won't for this moment. Uh, can you put your hands together for these two? I've really been very brave. Thank you both. You guys can slip off right now. Thank you. I will come and hug you both afterwards. It takes courage to, to do this, to be willing to do this in front of all of you guys. So, so yeah, thank you so much, you too. It's awesome to be able to impact a billion lives. I love that mission that everyone's on here at Mind Valley U. And you can impact one life at a time. And when you spend time with mission-driven people, every time you impact one of those lives, that ripple effect is huge. It's the game I love to play. And I, I don't want that to, to be dismissed when we think about the twofold elements of these next two days, transformation and impact. It happens inside of a conversation. It happens one conversation at a time.
So what, what I'll do, I'll share with you everything that was up on the wall. I didn't want to give you too much information and there wasn't a chance to give you the questionnaire to, to do before the session. But I'll, I'll, here's the problem with strategy that most people fall into. This is the trap of saying, hey, I've got the answers for you. Let me tell you what the strategy is that you should follow. And let me do this. I want to tell you three traps that high performers fall into on a regular basis. The first is the emptiness trap. These are some of the, the phrases that I hear from the people I work with. See if any of these resonate for you. I have everything I've ever wanted, but I feel empty. Anyone ever had that at any time in their life? I have everything I ever wanted, but I feel empty inside. Thank you. I had a client who was a pilot of 767s. An amazing lifestyle, amazing life, and something was missing. But the problem, with these are guilty secrets of top performers. You can't share these with people. Who wants to hear you tell your problems when you say, I've got everything I ever wanted? The challenge of being a top performer is you have these guilty secrets and when you share, if you ever dared to share them, people would say, I wish I had your problems. So you don't share them. I'm bored. I could do this with my eyes closed. I had a client who at 33 year, years old was running a $30 million company that she started in her 20s. And she was bored. She's like, bored, I can do this with my eyes closed. Anyone either currently or in the past have a great deal of success and have that feeling of like, I'm bored, I can do this with my eyes closed. That's the emptiness trap. Here's the isolation trap. I'm not lonely, but I feel very alone. I'm not lonely, but I feel very alone. I had a client who was a Navy bomb disposal expert. He served in Afghanistan. He knew what it was like to have team in a way that most of us will never understand what team means, to be on mission in a way that most of us don't understand being on mission. Now, what he was doing as a veteran that was what he felt constantly. I'm not lonely, but I feel very alone. Anyone else know that feeling in life or in business? How about this one, the isolation trap? I'm exhausted, but if I stop working so hard, it will all go away. Who knows that one? And then there's the imposter trap. People admire me, but I feel lazy. People admire me. Despite all of my accomplishments and all the acknowledgements I get, people are full of admiration for me, but on the inside, I feel lazy. Who knows that one? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a real secret among real top performers. And one of the interesting things about that one is when I work with clients, I help them understand that my job is to help them feel lazier and lazier as time goes on. Because being, feeling, feeling lazy as a top performer means you're doing those one or two things that only you can do that no one else on the planet can do. They're so effortless and easy that you feel lazy, but you're making the biggest difference you could make. People admire me, but I feel like a fraud. Anyone know this one? People admire me, but I feel like a fraud. I had a client who was the, used to be the assistant chief scientist to the high performance wing of the airport, Air Force. She was also a published poet. On a regular basis, I would cut and paste her bio and email it to her almost every week for the first six months of us working together. It doesn't matter who you are, when you're achieving a lot, you can still feel like a fraud on the inside. My mission today was twofold. To show you that transformation can happen in a single conversation and a powerful insight can shift everything. But also, to show you that you're not alone. In a world where so many of us are mission-driven, it's possible to feel really lonely, to carry a lot of guilty secrets and keep things on the inside. And I hope today, by sharing some of mine, by having people who are brave enough to share some of theirs, and having you willing to raise your hands, that we've all shifted a little bit into stepping deeper into our power and our greatness. Guys, thank you for giving me your attention. I love you.